Um, we're going to pick up <clears throat> pick up with chapter three, the muster of Rowan, in whatever book that is. Is it Return of the King or is it book book five of Return of the King? First half of Return of the King. We left off the other day with Aragorn talking with Eowyn, and Eowyn asked to go with them because she wants to spend her life as she wishes, as he put it. And he says, you know, if you can do that with honor, and she goes on and on um, about being a shield maiden, not a serving woman, etc., etc. For just a moment, before we get to Muster Rowan, What does Eowyn really seek? Ooh, it's not the answer I expected. What does Eowyn seek? Death? Glory? Glory? To prove herself? Wow, all of your responses are getting at things that I'm going to talk about in Harry Potter. <laughs> that Harry, in one sense, kind of uh, deals with. Anything else? Husband, two kids, house thing, you know, the suburbs and such? No, definitely not that. Can she get all three? Yeah, she could prove herself by dying a glorious death, you know, kind of a thing. Where does she think glory comes from? Back, okay. Keep going. Well, she thinks that if she actually proves herself on the battle, that it will show basically kind of feminism in a way. She thinks that like they want her to stay at home, raise kids, take care of the um, like village and stuff okay. like that. Let me rephrase the question. Let me put it kind of in a negative. Where does she think glory may not be found? In living. Keep going. In the continuing Okay. What you anyway? Be more specific than that. Just living, just living is glorious. How many? How many of you woke up this morning thinking, "Ah, oh, life is glorious"? I mean, really? Uh, nobody did. Okay. In living, how? Let me put it that way. This is getting at a question that we're going to deal with when we get to Harry Potter in December, you know. Um, what does she think is not glorious? Or what does she think does not earn one glory? A peaceful death, A peaceful death possibly. What else? How, how about before you die? How about between now and then? <laughs> Those very things that she and Aragorn were talking about. She accepted a charge, right? How about doing what one is charged to do, period? Or let's put it in a more modern kind of context, a more real context. <clears throat> How many of you think, and I know this is a silly, stupid question, how many think you're going to die some glorious death in battle? Uh, I didn't think so. Um, how many of you think that you can, and, and a lot of this depends on how you define that term, how you can, so if you're not going to earn a glorious, you know, if you're not going to earn a glory in death in battle, can you earn glory any other way? You're not going to guess. Yeah. How? Um, in a different standpoint than the nature, but I know one that's harder to be 
the U.S. Congress of the Pacific Sun, a religious oriented community. When I look at it from a religious standpoint, it's glorious and I preach with great love. And that was the most important words in the three months. Okay. Did you get it pretty close to what I'm looking for? What else? When you come to your first um, when you fulfill the purpose, you will keep on pursuing. Okay. And you're at that point of life, you're like, I'll do it faster. I can go after this one. Okay. But again, that's kind of implying, and I'm not saying you're <laughs> saying that. I'm saying this is what I'm inferring from that. That's, you know, when you reach some point and you're looking back. Mm-hmm. What about right now? Literally, this moment. Is there anything you can do or say or think that maybe doesn't get everybody in this class to go, oh, that's glorious, but is deserving, let's say, of glory or renown, like fame. And I don't mean fame, getting your name in the newspapers or on the internet. False fame. That's bullshit fame. Okay, pardon my French. How about doing the best you can do at what you're doing? That's what Aragorn's really getting at when he's talking about, you agree to do this, so do this, what? To the best of your ability. Because remember when she says, that's just, you know, so that the men can come back. And he says, what about when the men don't come back? And there's nobody to sing your song. She takes that to say, well, that's just to say, then it's all not worth anything anyways. I'm the hell with you. That's not what he's saying. Okay, I'm harping on this because we're going to see, if I remember to point it out, we're going to see a change in Eowyn's thinking. Uh, a colleague of mine who started teaching the course, because um, I gave him permission to, because he's a big Tolkien nut and he's a big Harry Potter fan. He's taught the Harry, co taught the Harry Potter course with me in London. Um, he kind of pointed this out to me one time when we were sitting in a pub drinking beer in London. That we're going to, there's a scene with Eowyn where she kind of, kind of, has like a conversion experience. And almost in a religious sense. She doesn't convert from, you know, Middle Earth pagan to Catholic Christian. Not not like that. But she kind of converts from one outlook on life, one way of thinking about the world, to one totally opposite. Okay? So she goes from this to this, Using religious language, she does what? If, you, if you're heading in this direction, and you stop, and you turn around, and you head in the exact opposite direction, what have you just done using religious language? You may not be familiar with it. You repent. Repent literally means to turn around, to go in the opposite direction you were going. Okay. If I remember, and if I don't, somebody tell me, to talk about the houses of healing, because it's in that chapter, all right? Now, go on to the muster of Rome, which we're not going to say much about. So, Rowan is getting ready. They're going to ride off to Gondor's defense. They don't know that Gondor is being attacked. It's not yet. But they know that's where, you know, the battle is going to be drawn, okay? And... We come down to page 801. I don't have a note or anything there. Mary wants to go with Ed. Why? Mary wants to go with King Theoden. He wants to ride off to battle with him. Why? Bingo. He's pledged his allegiance to him. To him. Specifically, not to the writers of Rowan, to Theoden. He says, you shall be as a father to me. All right? Bottom of 801. 
Theoden turns to Mary and says, I'm going to war. I release you from your charge. Okay, there's that language. Or I release you from my service. All right? But not from my friendship. You're going to stay here with the Lady Eowyn while I'm going to go get killed. Mary, but I, I offered you my sword. I don't want to be part from you for like this. All my friends have gone to the battle. I would be ashamed to stay behind. He said, no, nah, we ride on horses tall and swift. You're a little short guy. <laughs> you can't ride a big horse, you know. And Tommy on the back of one. I'm going. No, you're not. All right? So, 802. Ellen comes up to Mary. She sees he is downfallen. He is depressed. And she gets him some armor. Right. And says, maybe we'll meet again. Page 804. The riders are all now marshaled. They've been vittled. They've got, you know, their supplies and all that kind of stuff. They're getting ready to begin the march to where Gondor is. And 804. Mary says again, I want to go. Look at Theoden's response. I received you for your safe keeping. In other words, when you pledged your fealty to me, I didn't really mean it. I just did it to keep you safe. Why? Because you're a little guy. You're like a child to me. You, you need to be protected. And Mary's kind of like, really? That's not what I meant. He says, none of my writers can bear you as burden. What does that mean? You will be a burden to them. They can't go into battle while having to be conscious of you at the same time. Okay? If the battle were before my gates, maybe your deeds would be remembered by the minstrels. Maybe you can earn some, you know, glory kind of here. Mary bows and walks away, taking the ground, and he's unhappy. And a rider comes up to him. Where will once not, a way opens, so we say. The rider whispers into Mary's ear. Mary looked up and saw it. it was the same, it was the young rider whom he had noticed in the morning. You wish to go with her, the Lord of the Marcos. I see it in your face. I do. Then go with me. I will bear you before me under my cloak until we are far afield. And this darkness is yet darker. This, what's the this darkness referred to? I think it's two things. One is literal. Sauron has put forward a darkness from Mordor. There's a storm growing. Okay, Cloud is covering the earth, so there's not much light. But it's another kind of darkness, too. And I think the other kind of darkness is actually in this writer's mind. This writer does not see the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. This writer thinks he's writing into what? Death. Such goodwill should not be denied. Say no more, David. Thank you. I don't know your name. Do you not? No, he doesn't. Call me Durnhelm. Dern comes from the Old English, dearnet, which means hidden, secret. Helm is not a shortened form of helmet. A helmet is a head protector. A helm is a protector. Who was the greatest hero of Rowan? Helm. That was his name. That's why the place is called Helm's Deep. He was the protector of the people. Like Finn is protector of the people. So it's the hidden or secret protector. Peter Jackson blows this thing totally away. And what I mean by that is he removes the suspense that Tolkien creates. Because if you're familiar with the scene, we know right here, when this happens, who 
Durnhelm is. Tolkien wants to reveal who Durnhelm is later for a couple of reasons, which we'll talk about very briefly, uh, which we'll talk about briefly when we get there. Chapter 4, Siege of Gondor. So notice, chapter 1, Minas Tirith, okay, Gandalf and Pippin go off to Minas Tirith and speak with Denethor. Chapter 2, Passing of the Great Company, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli leave Mary and the Riders of Rowan, and they go off, okay, to the Paths of the Dead. They go through the Paths of the Dead. Chapter 3, Muster of Rowan. Now we only have Mary of the original Fellowship, and he goes off with Durnhelm and the Riders of Rowan. Chapter 4, we go back to Gandalf and Pippin in Minas Tirith, and we have the Battle of Gond uh, the Siege of Gondor. Okay, Black Riders come. Uh, the battle begins. Eight twelve. Faramir shows up. Okay, and Faramir talks about a couple of halflings that he met in Athelion. And that he left them, and they were going off to the Tower of Kirith Ungol and going into the Morgul Vale, page 812. And Gandalf, when, when, Faramir, top of that page, 812, uh, parted with them in the morning two days ago. Okay. And Gandalf's walking, and he's figuring out time and distances in his mind as he walks. Okay. And so Faramir looks at his father, middle of the page, and says, I hope I have not done ill. Not only, that doesn't only refer to letting Sam and Frodo go. That refers to leaving his men, the men of Athelion, who are used to fighting in the woods, in the wild. Guerrilla warfare. G-U-E-R-R, -R, not G-O-R-I-L-L-A. Okay? He leaves his men to reinforce the troops at Osgiliath. I hope that I have not done ill, and he looks to his father. Ill? Why do you ask? The men were under your command. In other words, you're the commander. Why are you asking me? Well, what would Denethor be in this battle, let's say, or in this military? Commander-in-chief. So you have a commander asking his superior, I uh, hope I did right. Or do you ask for my judgment on all your deeds? Ah, notice, Denethor wants to get at another issue. He's kind of saying, I don't give a rat, you know what, for what you did with your men at Osgiliath. But let's talk about these halflings again. Let's go back to that point. See, you have spoken skillfully as ever. Skillfully, full of skill. You know what that word skill goes back to Old English, goes back to Old Norse, actually, language of the Vikings. You know what it means? To part, to separate. It means to be able to distinguish, to discriminate between things. And he says, oh, you've spoken skillfully. In other words, you knew what to keep silent and you knew what to say. But have I not seen your eye fixed on Miss Randir? That is, while you've been talking, you've been looking at Gandalf. Kind of, come on, Gandalf, give me some cues. Should I keep going or should I stop? Seeking whether you said well or too much, he has long had your heart in his keeping. What does Denethor mean? He's long had your heart in his keeping. It's not a homoerotic thing, as some idiots suggest. He's saying, he looks to you more for guidance. Or, excuse me, you look to him, you, Faramir, look to Gandalf more for guidance than you do to me. My son, your father is old, but not yet dotard. I'm old, but I'm not imbecile. I'm not 
senile. I can see in here, as was my what? That is just like I used to be able to see in here. And little of what you have half said or left unsaid is now hidden from me. I know the answer of the riddles. In other words, I know what the halfling bore. Alas for Boromir. Why alas for Boromir? Because he's going to say, he would have brought it to me. Which is what Peter Jackson wants Faramir to do in the film. But he ends up not doing it. Okay? If what I've done displeased you, my father, I wish I'd known your counsel before the burden of so weighty a judgment was thrust on me. If I've done wrong, you should have told me beforehand what you wanted me to do. I don't know if I mentioned it here. My other two classes, my, my intro and lit courses, we're doing tragedy now. And I gave a definition of tragedy it, as you have a tragic hero when a person has to make a decision but doesn't have the information that is needed to make that decision properly. They only have partial information. Let's jump to Harry Potter for a moment. Okay? Jump to towards the end of Harry Potter. Should I go there? So somebody says, yes, yes. What's the partial? Don't give anything else away. You don't have to do anything. Just, just what's the partial information Voldemort hears about Harry Potter? Before that, the one born at the end of the seventh month, whose parents have thrice defied you, will what? Be the one to destroy you. That's a paraphrase. And so he's like, pulls out the birth record. You know, who was born at the end of the seventh month? Who are his parents? Thrice defied me. Two children. Which one is it? And he goes for which one? He goes for the one like himself. What information does he not have? Don't answer, don't answer. For those of you who are familiar with the novels, you know the information he doesn't have. And if he had that information, Voldemort wouldn't be a tragic hero or a tragic protagonist, if you want. But he doesn't have that information, so it makes a damn stupid mistake. Okay? Really want to say more, but I can't. So, notice, would that have prevailed to change your judgment. If you had known ahead of time, would you have done any differently? Okay, what are they talking about? What, what is the unspoken context? The ring. If I had known you wanted me to bring you Sauron's ring ahead of time, if I'd known that ahead of time, then I would have done differently. Okay? Or he doesn't say I would have done differently. He just says, I wish I'd known your counsel before the burden of a weighty, so weighty a judgment was thrust on me. I wouldn't have had to decide. Denethor says, okay, so if I had told you, if you should ever find the ring of Sauron, bring it to me, would it have made any difference? Based upon what we know of Faramir's character, if his father had said, bring me Sauron's ring, the one ring of power, so that I might use it to defend Gondor and overthrow Sauron. Reading into it, we can't answer categorically. Would Faramir have brought it to him? My own reaction? I don't think he would have brought it. Why? I would not do thus. To save minister. He would, Faramir wouldn't use the ring. Do you think he would let his father use it? I kind of don't think so. You would still have done just so. I deem, there's that word again, deem, I judge. I know you well. Ever your desire is to appear lordly and generous as a king of old. Gracious, gentle. The most important word in that sentence. Seem. Because what he's literally saying 
when you understand that C indicates a condition contrary to fact, is you are not, what? Like a king of old, lordly, generous, gracious, gentle. You want to appear that way. He's kind of casting aspersions at his son. He's saying there's some inner, inner motivation. There's something you're trying to keep hidden. Question, is there? Or is Faramir really lordly, generous as a king of old, gracious and gentle? Could you say that about Boromir? No, you could not. I think it's pretty clear. You can say it about Faramir. In other words, You know what that stands for? What you see is what you get. He is how he appears. Okay? That may well befit one of high race if he sits in power and peace. But in desperate hours, gentleness may be repaid with death. In other words, Fairmere, we're desperate. What do you have to do in desperate times? Louder. You have to take desperate measures. You do what? You do unto others before they do unto you. You've got to strike before they can strike you. So be it, says Faramir. So be it, says you know, Yeah, really? You know. But not with your death only, Lord Faramir, with the death also of your father and of all your people, whom it is your part to protect, now that Boromir is gone. He's saying, you can't just rush off into death and die in battle. No, no, no. Boromir is dead. You've got to defend your people. Faramir, do you wish then that our places have been exchanged? Do you? It's a nice fancy way of saying what? Do you wish Boromir was alive and I was dead? Um, yes, <laughs> I wish that indeed. Put yourself in Faramir's position. I don't know if any of you have siblings. I have an older brother. You know, it's easy for me to go, really? Dad, do you wish, you know, I was dead and Tim was still alive kind of a thing? My brother's still alive, by the way. Okay? And he says, yes. What does it do to you at that moment? Well, you. <laughs> and that's what happens in Faramir's mind. Okay? For Boromir was loyal to me and no wizard's pupil. Keep in mind, Gandalf's just kind of sitting there watching this go on. He would have remembered his father's need and would not have squandered what fortune gave. He would have brought me a mighty gift. And Faramir's like, um, you do remember why I was a Dillian and not Boromir. Ouch. Why, is, why did I say ouch? Why is Boromir dead? Because his father sent him north. His father sent him to Rivendell. Who was supposed to go? In other words, if you had sent me... Boromir would still be alive. That's why I said, ouch. Yes, Leah? I mean, are we sure that Faramir would have died? No! Because part of the reason that Boromir died was his greed and he distracted the company from the orcs that came. So if Faramir was A greedy, very large part, like 99% of the part. Boromir died because what? To, to, to quote the... Uh, the last surviving knight of the Holy Grail in Indiana Jones and the Holy, you know, whatever the thing is, you know, he chose poorly. <laughs> he chose to go after the ring. And he died because of it. Yes, he died saving Mary and Pippin. He died well in that sense. But he was put in a position to die because of his choice. Okay? We don't know that that would have happened to Fairman. I mean, part of me thinks Fairmere would have got to Lothlorien and said, oh, 
I'm just going to stay here, man. This was a great place, okay? For a moment, okay, Faramir's restraint gave way, and then he says those words, stir not the bitterness in the cup that I mix for myself, and I shut the hell up. That's what that means. Shut the hell up. Gandalf, comfort yourself. Boromir wouldn't have brought this to you. You think Boromir would have brought this to you? He is dead. He died well. May he sleep in peace. You deceive yourself. He would have kept it for his own. Denethor, you only say that because you couldn't sway Boromir to your self, you know. So he talks about his wisdom, Denethor does. Gandalf, okay, then what is your wisdom? I'm going to cut short what I usually spend a lot more time on. What's Denethor's wisdom? We should have taken the ring, we could have buried it somewhere in the bowels of Minas Tirith. Or, at the very last need, used it. Okay? And Gandalf again says, bottom of 8.13, you're thinking only of Gondor. What did he already tell Denethor? I'm steward of all of Middle-earth. You're steward of Gondor. Yet there are other men and other lives, and time still to be. And for me, I pity even his slaves. Who are Sauron's slaves? What are Sauron's slaves? Orcs. Orcs. Gandalf is saying, I even pity them. Why? Because they are living beings that once, way, 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 back in the midst of time were good. They were elves. They were elves that were twisted and broken. We could throw in today through, you know, genetic engineering and bringing in, you know, animals and such. Jennifer, and where will men look for help if Gondor falls? If we fall, everything else is gone. Okay? If I had this thing now, we wouldn't shake with dread under this gloom. Why? Why wouldn't we shake with dread? What did Putin just come out and say the other day? Anybody know? Okay, keep going. Talking about Ukraine. What else? He's mobilized their military, first time since World War II, calling up 300,000 men that aren't in the military. So, welcome to the draft. Kind of interesting. All flights out of Russia are booked for like the next four or five days. Because men are trying to leave. The roads are jam-packed. Road leading into Finland. 35 kilometer line. That's like a little over 18 miles. Parking lot. People are trying to flee. That's not the real bad stuff. He came, he literally said. I've got a ton of nukes, and I will use them. I am not bluffing. Literally said, you do something stupid, and I will use nuclear weapons. He didn't say, and I will use them only in Ukraine. People who in the past have been known to speak for him have said, literally, London Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, York. You better watch out. If your eyes aren't big, they should be big. If your pulse hasn't just increased a little bit, it should increase a little bit. Okay, That's the position Denethor thinks he's in. All these nukes are aimed at Gondor. And he's thinking, and I've got an ace up my sleeve. I can stop this, okay? Gandalf, Denethor ends. If you do not trust me to endure the test, you do not know me yet. Gandalf, nonetheless, I do not trust you. Why? Look at what he says. 
Had I done so, I could have sent this thing hither to your keeping and spared myself and others much anguish. I do not trust myself in this. Okay? And for a moment, Gandalf and Denethor have their you know, staring contest. And once more, Pippin feels the strain, you know, and looks at them and sees them kind of almost with other vision. If I had, if you had, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So he asks Faramir, how strong is the garrison of Osgiliath? He says, it's not strong. Do you should go, you know, build it up, etc. And Denethor tells him to go get some food and rest. Um, Pippin and Gandalf talk about Frodo. Uh, 816. Faramir comes back into the presence of Denethor. They talk some more. He gets ready to leave. And Faramir says, bottom of that page, if I should return, think better of me. Why if? If I don't die out there, think better of me. Look at Denethor's response. You got it, son. I'll think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, I'll think whatever. No, what does he say? That depends on the manner of your return. If Denethor was a coach and Fairman was a team and they're going in for the second half and they're down by a lot of points, what kind of speech has he just given his team to psych him up? You suck and you're going to die. Or... You suck, and you're going to come back off the field even worse than you are now. Not a good pick-me-upper, you know. Fair mirror. Uh, that depends on the manner of your return. What's it mean? Are you going to return tail between your legs? Anybody know, anecdotally I think this is, what Spartan women told their husbands when they went off into battle? They gave him an option. Return with your shield or on it. That is, don't lose. Either come back victorious or come back dead. There is no other way. There is no, oh, we're going to negotiate for peace. Uh-uh. There is, no, peace is won by killing. That's it. Or you achieve the eternal peace, you know, by dying. And Gandalf goes up to Faramir, 817. Do not throw your life away rashly or in bitterness. Don't go out there and do what? Go off into the hottest part of the front of the battle. Don't say, my life is meaningless because my father thinks I'm dirt. You will be needed here for other things than war. What other things? They're in the midst of a war. What other things? What's Gandalf projecting, predicting, possibly? Keep going. Keep going. How? You're you're skipping over the part I'm looking for. No, no, not that. The war will end. Peace will come again to Gondor. There will be a place for you. Then he's implying. Now this is the, come on guys, you can win even if you're down 100 to nothing, you know. Your father loves you, Faramir, and will remember it ere the end. He doesn't say how soon <laughs> before the end. It might be on his dying breath, you know. Oh, Faramir. <laughs> Okay, so Fairmere goes out, and let's see. Siege of Gondor comes. The Nazgul come. The Nazgul are the Black Riders now riding flying beasts. No better way to think of them than dragons. Tolkien loved dragons. Okay? He always said he wanted. He really needed to believe that dragons were real. They just made the world a better place, you know, kind of a, kind of a thing. Okay. 
So, Denethor gives up, pages 824-25, but he does so only after Faramir is brought back in, kind of on his shield. He's not dead yet. He's mostly dead. He's really hurt. He's comatose, high fever, top of 824. Men come running to Denethor looking for aid. He says, I will not come down. I must stay beside my son. He might still speak before the end, but that end, but that is near. Follow whom you will, even the grave fool. His hope has failed. What consumes Denethor's mind at this point? Despair. He has no hope. So Gandalf takes command of Gondor. Okay? 825, we find out now. Minas Tirith is built on seven levels. The lowest circle, circle one, and then two, three, four, five, etc. So the lowest circle is now burning, page 825. And men are flying from the walls and leaving them unmanned. Okay? Part of that is because, I don't remember if it's been described already or if that comes a little bit later, we're going to see orcs and the forces of Sauron take the heads of their enemies and put them in catapults and launch them over the walls. That's kind of, you know, disheartening, right? Think of what the word disheartening means. It breaks the heart. It breaks the will to fight because, you know, oh, there's Fred. Oh, there's John, my son. Yeah. Right? Okay. Why? Why do the fools fly? Denethor says on 825. Better to burn sooner than late, for burn we must. We're all going to die, so you might as well just sit down and die rather than try to put up a fight. So he gets taken up to the halls of the dead, right? Because he thinks we're all going to die. He's going to. Oh, let me use a phrase that somebody else used. Spend his life. Rather than wait for them to come take it, he's going to have his funeral pyre built. He's going to sit up on it. He's going to take Faramir in his arms, even though he's still alive, and he's going to go light the fire. Okay? 827. Pippin's trying to, you know, find somebody who can help stop Denethor. He thinks it's foolishness. Faramir Pippin does. So Pippin goes and finds Gandalf, bottom 828, top of 829. Gandalf is a little preoccupied at this point. Why? He's down at the gates of Minas Tirith. That first circle I said, you know, all on fire? He's there, standing at the gates, and we're told, 829, the gate breaks open the first time in history. These gates had never been breached. Gondor is thousands of years old. In road, the Lord of the Nazgul. Who is the Lord of the Nazgul? That's the captain of the nine. The witch king of Angmar. Angmar, whose forces, those swords, were forged that Tom Bombadil took out of the barrow and gave to the hobbits. A great black shape against the fires beyond, he loomed up, grown to a vast menace of despair. In other words, just seeing him makes men's hearts quail and they fall away. All but one. Nears Gandalf. Silent and still in the space before the gate, sitting on Shadowfax, who alone among all the free horses of the world endured the terror, etc. And Gandalf says, you cannot enter here. And notice, the huge shadow halts. Why? What did Gandalf say to the Balrog? You cannot pass. You cannot enter. Just stop. It's not like he goes and puts a force field. No. Go back to the abyss prepared for you. Go back. Fall into the nothingness that awaits you and your master. The black rider flings back his hood, and what do we see? A crown? 
but it's not sitting on anything. Red fire shone between it and the old mantle and the mantle shoulders. Old fool, he cries. Old fool, this is my hour. Do you not know death when you see it? Die now and curse in vain. Another biblical quotation with one word missing. Job's wife says to Job, after all of their children are destroyed, all of the livestock is killed, and Job breaks out in the, I don't know, 10th or 11th century BC version of AIDS. I mean, he's got open sores just oozing all over. And she says, die now and curse God in vain. Okay. Gandalf doesn't move. Notice Gandalf doesn't say anything. But at the very moment that the black writer says that, what happens? We hear something off in the distance. A cock crowed. Shrill and clear he crowed. Wrecking, thinking, considering. Nothing of wizardry or more. Welcoming only the morning that in the sky far above the shadows of death was coming with the dawn. What did Gandalf tell Denethor about his stewardship? He says, if this day passes, and in the morning, something blooms, something is still alive, I will not have wholly failed. This is the indication, cue the little orphan Annie song, the sun will come up tomorrow. <laughs> because we hear that damn bird going, rawr, rawr, rawr. and then what happens? Like an echo, the hero responds. It's not another cock crowing. It's the riders of Rowan. They hear the horns. Okay? The riders were here. So we're going to skip a whole bunch. They get to the fields of Pelennor. In fact, we're just skipping that chapter in time. Go to the Battle of Pelennor Fields. You get to the battle. The riders are you know, riding among the orcs and the Armies of Sauron and such. Page 840-841. Gnod School leaves Minas Tirith, comes back out to the battle, and lands. And when it lands, when it alights on the ground, it startles Theoden's horse, Snowman, so that the horse falls, and it falls on Theoden. Okay. And it wields a mace. But there, then, bottom 840, was not utterly forsaken. The knights of his house lay slain about him, or else mastered by the madness of their steeds were borne far away. Yet one stood there still, Durnhelm. So Durnhelm is standing there, loving his lord like a father. Mary's there still, okay? And Mary thinks, he doesn't say this, king's man, king's man, in other words, I swore myself to this king. You must stay by him as a father, he says. But his will made no answer. His heart says you have to go to him, but that's his heart. What doesn't kick into gear? His legs. Because <laughs> his will says, that way be death. Then out of the blackness he thinks he hears, or he thought he heard, Durnhelm speaking. Be gone, foul Dwemer Lake. Lord of Carrion, leave the dead in peace. Top of 841. Come not between the Nod School and his prey. The Nod School is the actual dragon like thing that wants to eat the horse and the man. For he will not slay thee in thy turret. He will bear thee away to the houses of lamentation. See, we're going to have the houses of healing with in two chapters. This is the house of lamentation. That's where you go and you get tortured forever. Beyond all darkness, where thy flesh shall be devoured, and thy shriveled mind be left naked to the lid of sigh. Yeah, 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 do what you want. <laughs> but I will hinder you if I may. Durnhelm says. Hinder me, thou fool. No living man may hinder me. Surprise! Great reveal. No living man am I. When the writer says... No living man may hinder me. You see, using man in the non-generic, 
excuse me, non-gendered sense, no living human type creature, or does he mean no literal human male? Because Eowyn says, I'm not a living human male. Eowyn I am, Eowyn's daughter. You stand between me and my lord and kin. Be gone if you be not deathless. Okay? Between my lord and kin. An old English scholar by the name of C.L. Wren, I always like to give him credit, in a book called A Study of Old English, posited that there was this, what he called the fourfold Germanic epic. Fourfold just means it has four parts to it, right? For the, the first part of the epic is you have a duty to your lord. The second part, you have a duty to your kin. Third part, you have a duty to avenge your lord and or kin. And the fourth part is a reliance on what's called weird. <laughs> it's where we get our modern English word weird from. Weird doesn't just mean strange. It kind of means will be, will be. What's going to happen is going to happen. You can't stop. It's not the same as fate. There's a little bit of difference, okay? So, duty to your Lord. You have a responsibility to your Lord. Same thing. You have a responsibility to your kid. If someone kills your Lord, you are honor-bound to retaliate, to avenge that death. If someone kills your family, a member of your family, you are honor-bound to avenge that. If your Lord is your kin, whoa, you're double honor bound. There's a problem, however, if one of your kin is the one who kills your Lord. Because how do you exact vengeance for your Lord on your own family member? Because you can't. You can't kill a member of your own family. It's a significant part in the Old English poem, Beowulf. Okay? So she's saying, you stand between my Lord and my kin. Get the hell away. All right? The winged creature screams at her. The ring wraith made no answer and was silent. Notice, as if in sudden doubt. He's kind of going back and going, wait, 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 wait. Was that prophecy generic or gender specific? I don't know. How do you figure out intent, you know, of a prophecy? Lord Voldemort has that same problem, by the way. So, Mary opens his eyes. He sees Durnhelm slash Eowyn and the Black Rider comes forth and strikes her. Okay? 842. Uh, before he does, she chops the head off the Nazgul. So, Eowyn. Dragon Slayer, you know. And that makes the Black Rider a little angry, you know. He comes up to her, swings his mace, breaks her arm. You've never seen a mace? Big handle, about two feet long, piece of chain, metal ball, about five to six pounds, spiked. All you have to do is swing it. You hit somebody in the head, you don't just knock them out. You cave the head in or knock it off depending on how hard you swing it. You hit someone in the chest with that, you kill him instantly, okay? So, he breaks her arm. She falls forward, she still has her sword, and anyone's thinking, and he crawls up, and he gets behind the Black Rider. He cries out, Eowyn, Eowyn, okay? And what does he do? He stabs him. Where does he stab him? Mary's like this tall. Black Rider's like this tall. He stabs him where he can reach him. Back of the knee. It's kind of implied he can't even reach him to his waist, you know, to aim for a liver or something. Back of the knee. I've had all kinds of knee problems. That would be really excruciating pain. Okay? Yes? Um, in the book and movie, it kind of correlates with the Sumerian world. Why does... He get affected when he gets 
stabs? Like, why did that hurt him? Good question. Why? Is it because of the powers of the flu, or like how old the animal is compared to the wound? No. It has something to do with the sword. Because it wasn't the proper sword? What is Mary's sword? Where did Mary get that sword? Tom Bombdill pulled it out of the barrow, looked at it, and told them what? These swords were created for battles against the witch king of Angmar and his forces. This is the witch king of Angmar. It has spells woven on it. Such as, totally facetious here, I'm making this up. If the sword is ever used to strike the witch king of Angmar, he will suffer grievous, you know, misfortune kind of a thing. In other words, it's only this sword or another sword similar to it that is woven with those spells made by the men of Western Essa that could have harmed him. Does she stab him? Does she literally? Yeah, I thought she, did. she holds it and he falls forward. Mm -hmm. But the prophecy, no living man may harm me. Oh, She's not a living man. She's a living woman. Mm -hmm. Notice Durnhill, hidden secret protector of what? Her lord and kin. So it takes those two together. Mary, with an uncommon sword, I used uncommon intentionally because we're going to find out Harry apparently has an uncommon skill, which we'll talk about when we get there, and Eowyn because she's a woman. All right? Does she earn great glory? Oh, yes. She killed the Lord of the Knot School. Gandalf didn't even do that, you know? And there stands Mary, you know, because what happens when he strikes him? He doesn't just strike him and go, ha, got you. That's a strength for the little people against the big people. No. His arm is damaged because of that, right? So Mary passes out after Theodore talks to him, you know, live now and bless it, you know, live long and prosper, and he does the whole Spock thing and, you know, he says, have a smoke. So, Eowyn and Theoden get brought into, uh, yeah, Eowyn and Theoden get brought into Minas Tirith. Mary has to make his way on his own because, you know, he's a little person, so they don't see him. We get the pyre of Denethor, and what do we find out? Why did Denethor, why was Denethor so full of despair? What's he been doing for many long years? Looking in the Palantir of Minas Tirith. He tells us what he saw. He looked in the Palantir of Minas Tirith. He looked into Baradur and he saw thousands upon thousands upon thousands of troops. In other words, what did Sauron do? Keep in mind, the Palantir only shows you what? What the other person using it, what? It only shows you what the person with the strongest will lets you see. Sauron had the stronger will. And Sauron wanted to destroy Denethor up here or in here. And so he shows him. A bazillion troops. To the CGI, you know, kind of a thing. So Denethor thinks there is no help. There is no hope. There is no help. Gandalf goes up, rescues Faramir. Denethor 854. Gandalf asks him, you know, before he's getting ready to correct himself, what would what would you like to have happen? <laughs> My wife and I were talking about this the other day. Or yesterday, because stuff I will tell you in a couple weeks, some things that have gone on kind of behind the scenes with something I said in class. 
<clears throat> and what does Gunnar Thorne say? I wish things were how they used to be. Go back to the beginning of the chapter, The Shadow of the Past. I wish it need not have happened in my time. Guess what, Buttercup? It did. Deal with it. Move on. Okay? It's essentially what Gandalf says. So, Denethor immolates himself, lights himself on fire, and lies there on the pyre with his hands on the palantir like this. So that anybody in the future who looks in the palantir, in the, you know, hands like this, what do they see? They just see Denethor burning, right? Houses of Healing. How much time we have? Nine o'clock, 25 minutes. So, Denethor's dead. Uh, Theoden's dead. He's not brought into the Houses of Healing. He's taken right to the city work. Faramir is in the Houses of Healing because he has suffered a grievous wound. Um, Eowyn is brought into the Houses of Healing because she has suffered a grievous wound. And finally, Mary is brought into the Houses of Healing. Okay? So you got the old healer, Eorith, there. And they're trying to figure out how to make these people feel better. And let's see here. Yorith mentions something about the hands of a king being the hands of a healer. And Gandalf like, smacks himself upside the head and sends for Aragorn. Aragorn comes in. And Gandalf again quotes the thing about the why is uh, about the hands of a king being the hands of a healer? Uh, 863, let's see here. He sends for, for Yorath. He asks her for Athelis, also called King's Foil. The same stuff he used to help Frodo on Weathertop. And she thinks it's, you know, it's like parsley. Really? We don't really regard much about this. He says it's got healing powers. So... Um, they heat it up, put it in water. Aragorn bends over Faramir, kind of wipes his brow with it. I think he might actually even give him a little taste of it. No, he doesn't. And top of 866, Aragorn calls him. Suddenly Faramir stirred and opened his eyes, and he looked on Aragorn who bent over him, and a light of knowledge and love was kindled in his eyes, and he spoke softly. What knowledge? Look what he says. My lord, you called me. I come. What does the king command? That's the knowledge. He opens his eyes, he sees Aragorn's face. What does he see? You know, the light bulb goes off in his head. This is the king. Okay. Notice, does Aragorn have a button? You know, hi, I'm Aragorn. Nice to meet you. Frodo has talked about Aragorn. Okay. But he hasn't given him a description. It's not like he has a photograph or anything. So how does he know he's the king? Because in medieval literature, and I think even in some classical literature, a king has a mark of kingship. Or as the character Kent in Shakespeare's King Lear, there is a, a something of majesty about the king. Aragorn has that. But it's only for those who have eyes to see. Faramir sees it immediately. Who didn't? Boromir. Who are you? Aragorn doesn't go. Elrond stands up and says, he's your future king. You should get down now. <laughs> like on your knees. 
Walk no more, so he gives him a command. Walk no more in the shadows, but awake. You are weary, rest a while, take food. Be ready when I return. <laughs> Notice, you're going to be needed. Get well. I will, Lord, for who would lie idle when the king has returned? Farewell, for, I, mean, I got to go see others, okay? And he leaves. And Yorith says, King! Did you hear that? So what happens? Yorith pulls out her phone and she starts texting everybody, you know? And word spreads. The king has returned. Has Aragorn come in with the ermine cloak, the crown, the ball and scepter? No, he hasn't. He still looks like straw eater. So he goes to Eowyn. Here there's a grievous hurt and a heavy blow. The arm that was broken has been tended with due skill. It'll be fine. It's the shield arm that was made, but the chief evil comes through the sword arm. That is, she suffered hurt from the arm that held the sword. And that there now seems no life, although it is unbroken. Why? She was pitted against the foe, blah, blah, blah. And yet he says... I know not how I should speak to her or of her. Why? When I first looked on her and perceived her unhappiness, this is the bottom of 866, it seemed to me that I saw a white flower standing straight and proud, shapely as a lily, and yet knew that it was hard, as if wrought by elf rites out of steel. Okay? Shapely like a lily, but hard as steel. How does that kind of describe Aowen? Could we use another term? It might be sexist. Okay, I'll just warn you the one I'm going to use, if unless somebody else comes to it first. Okay, how so? It's really tough on one side and like tough and strong on that one on the other side. She doesn't necessarily appear that way. Okay, so peace. Described her as being like steel. That implies it's tough on the outside. And I think tough on the inside. Cold. Frigid. Bitter. Tempered. Like when you temper steel, you harden it so that it cannot be broken. He's saying, she was like this even before. Or was it... I I don't know, maybe a frost that had turned its sap to ice? Its sap, the lily? Maybe something happened that caused her to freeze inside? And so it stood, bittersweet, still fair to see, but stricken soon to fall and die. Her malady begins long before this. Am I right, Amir? Amir, I don't know what you're talking about. Hello, close brother. I hold you blameless. Well, did anybody suggest Aragorn was to blame? By merely suggesting or merely stating, I hold you blameless, that implies you know, she wasn't like this before she saw you, Aragorn. I knew not that Aragorn was touched by any frost until she first looked on you. Um, I mean, care and dread she had shared with me, you know, worm tongues, bewitchment, all that kind of stuff. But that didn't bring her to this pass. So what is Aomir not accusing Aragorn of? And I say that not kind of facetiously. I mean, he's literally not accusing him, but he's saying she wasn't like this until she saw you. So not your fault. I'm not saying you did anything, but... Gandalf says, you had horses and deeds of arms in the free fields, but she, born in the body of a maid, had a spirit and courage at least the match of yours. Gandalf saying, if she'd been born in a male's body, oh, what a warrior she would have been. But because the society of Rowan doesn't value, he's implying. He's not stating this. He's implying. But because the value, the society of Rowan doesn't value that kind of spirit in a woman, she had to do what? 
She had to push it down. She had to repress it. Yet she was doomed to wait upon an old man whom she loved as a father and watch him falling into a mean, dis mean means common, low. Doesn't mean, ooh, that person's mean, angry. Okay? Into a mean, dishonored dotage. And her part seemed to her more ignoble than that of the staff he leaned on. He's saying, she didn't have an outlet for that spirit. What could she have done? Helping Thaven. What would have happened if she had killed Wormtongue? She knew what Wormtongue was doing. She would have been charged. She would have been wrong for murdering the king's advisor. Do you think Wormtongue had poison only for Theoden's ears? Have you not heard the word Saruman spoke? My lord, if your sister's love for you and her will, still bent to her duty, had not restrained her lips, you might have heard even such things as these escape them. In other words, Wormtongue filled her mind with the same kinds of dark fantasies as he filled Theoden's mind with. And I think part of what Gandalf is getting there is he's suggesting, well, two things. One, what did Wormtongue what did Wormtongue think Saruman would reward him with? Maybe. Eowyn. Yeah, oh. Eowyn. Ew. Eowyn would be Wormtongue's. Right? Who knows what she spoke to the darkness alone in the bitter watches of the night when all her life seemed shrinking and the walls were bower closing in about her. Remember she talked about the cage? I think he's suggesting Wormtongue put a lot of ideas into her mind. And one of those ideas might have been you could go out and win great glory. Oh, but you're a woman, so you can't. Is that why, because I was thinking that that was kind of on the book, but then when I kind of watched the movie, while he was working and she was a yeah. kid, he was like working and watching her. Yeah, he's a dirty old man. Okay. He's a stalker who has license to stalk, so to speak. Because he's the king's advisor, the king's right hand man. Okay? Aomer was silent, looks on his sister, looks at Aragorn. Aragorn says, I I, you know, I saw what you saw. In other words, I'm not stupid, Aomer. I knew what she was thinking when she looked at me. Yes, sex was one of those things. But what else was she thinking? There's the door. There's my way out. Way out of being a woman? Way out of being married? No, not that. Way out of this bondage to servitude in worm tongue, you know, kind of stuff. But also what? Life of a king. You want to talk about glory? That's glory, okay? So, Aragorn says, I might be able to hear about it. And to recall her from the dark valley. <laughs> That's, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's that valley. He says, but to what she will awake? Hope or forgetfulness or despair? I don't know. It's almost like he's implying, maybe we should just let her go. I don't think he is. I'm not suggesting that. It's, it's almost like. Because what happens if she just wakes to despair? Really? Is that a blessing? I mean, we have in our judicial system, it's totally ludicrous. You know, if somebody is deemed guilty of first degree murder, but they're not guilty because of insanity, there, there is part of our judicial system that says, or they're, you know, deserving of death, they can't be executed until they're of sound mind. So you put them on drugs to make them sane, to make them realize what they've done is wrong, then you kill them. When maybe, when they actually did the killing, they weren't sane. How screwed up is that, you know? 
So Aragorn stoops. He looks into her face. He calls her out. She doesn't stir. Brings more Avalis. 868, he calls her again. Awake, the shadow's gone. Darkness is washed clean. He takes her hand and puts it in Aelmer's. Why? Because he says, she loves you more than she loves me. What does she love about Aragorn? She loves the idea of Aragorn. She loves the idea of the king. In order to love somebody, you have to know them, right? Please say yes. Okay. Even though I'm not kidding, when I first saw my wife, literally from a distance, I thought, actually, it's after talking to her for a few minutes, I thought, I'm going to marry her. She was like, not going to happen. No. We dated, broke up, stabbed my heart, broke up for a long time. Then I ignored her for like two weeks. <laughs> Lured her in, you know, kind of a thing. He's saying, why does she love Aylmer more than him? Brother. That's why. Okay? So, he then goes to Mary. He heals Mary. What does Mary ask for? Got any weed to smoke, man? <laughs> he asks for pipe weed. And Aragorn's like, I didn't go through, you know, like you know, fire and death to bring you pipe weed. And Aragorn's looking at his pack, which has his pipe sticking out and a little bit of tobacco in it. Okay? So, the last debate, very quickly. They won this battle, right? This was the Battle of Gondor, the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. They won this battle. Winning a battle is not the same as winning the war. you got to defeat the powers that are behind the war. So we get the last debate. And the part I want to pick up with is page 878. What's the last debate? Now what do we do? Literally, what do they do? Do we stay here and build Fortress Gondor? Do we repair the walls? Do we repair the walls outside the Pelennor fields? Do we rebuild Osgiliath? Do we man up the army, so to speak, and wait for Sauron to attack? What are the other options? Pull back. We could even pull back farther and build other defenses, or, somebody said it, attack. 878. Gandalf tells them what Denethor said when he, about what he saw when he looked into the Palantir. He said, the stones of seeing do not lie. That is, Sauron could not force Denethor to see something that wasn't real. He can maybe by his will choose what things shall be seen by weaker minds, or cause them to mistake the meaning of what they see. But he can't make it reveal an untruth. Hardly has our strength suffered suffice to beat off the first great assault. He says, we won this one by the skin of our teeth, or, let's be more accurate, by the arm of a hobbit and the arm of a woman. You think, you know, we're going to send out Mary and Eowyn to take on Sauron. <laughs> so, Emmer Hill says, so you want us to retreat to Minas Tirith or to Dal Amroth or to Dunhera, the passes, passage of the dead. Gandalf, that would be no new counsel. This is what we've been doing for all the years of Denethor. He said no. I said this would be prudent to stay here and build up our defenses. Q. Dana Carvey doing his George H.W. Bush, you know, not prudent impression. I do not counsel, pr what's prudence? Wise action. Counsel, can't go say, I'm not suggesting we take a wise action. Why? Okay, sometimes you have to be reckless. Why else? If you're wargaming, okay, literally playing a war game, and you say, I'm going to do this because this is the wise course of action. Well, who else is going to think that's the wise course of action? 
the people on the other side. Because they're war gaming too. Right? It's all part of the game of strategy, so to speak. Gandalf says, no, I don't want to do wisdom. Let's pull a foolish move. Because people aren't going to expect you to do something that is really foolish for your part. I said victory could not be achieved by arms. That is, militarily. I hope for victory, but not by arms. Why? The ring still figures in. So, Gandalf saying, we're over here, the gates of uh, Mordor are here, we can't win by force of arms, but we still have hope in the ring being destroyed. Where's the ring? Down here. So what does he suggest they essentially do? Let's make ourselves bait. Let's march to the black gate, bang on it. For what purpose? They're a distraction. It's a diversionary tactic. We draw Sauron out up here in all his forces to make it easier for Frodo and Sam by their little lonesomes to try to sneak in the back door. Okay? So how do they do the diversion? As they march through the territory, they've got the herald out there blowing his trumpet, make way for the king and the Lord Gandalf and all the high and mighty ones. You know, and Sauron is seeing all this. What else? 879. Gandalf says, uh, Aragorn, am I right in thinking that you showed yourself to Sauron? He says, yes. By the way, back up for just a moment. How did Aragorn, Aragorn should be, enter the battle? He wasn't with the riders of Ron, right? Passed through the passage of the dead, and then what? He came to the port or harbor of Telargir, and he took the, the ships and went up the Anduin, and what were the forces of Minas Tirith thinking when they saw the ships, the Corsairs of Umbar, as they're called? Oh, crap. More enemy forces. And then what did everyone do? He had his flag unfurled. The white tree with the crown of Elendil and the seven stars. So big deal. It's like, is the flag a major, you know, some kind of powerful weapon or talisman? No. But what does it mean? The king. Only the king can fly that. That instills hope in the forces of Minas Tirith, but to Sauron's forces, they're like, oh my God, there's a king back. You know, and it was a king that cut the ring off Sauron's finger. Okay? So, we need to ride forth. Why? To challenge Sauron, okay, to get him to attack first because the rash stroke goes astray, and to help Frodo. Chapter 10, the Black Gate opens. Very, very quickly. Who comes out in front of the Black Gate? What's he called? Two different things he's called. Sauron's lieutenant or the mouth of Sauron. This is Sauron's ambassador. And what does he do? He shows them what? Frodo's elvish cloak, his mithril coat. Okay. Does he show him Sting? Does he show him the file of Galadriel? Does he go, oh, and by the way, we have the ring? Nope. But when he shows them the mithril coat and the elvish cloak, what does Pippin do? Ah. Just gave it away. Okay. And he demands. Total, complete, unconditional surrender. What's he end up to? Oh, it's a, almost said a word I probably shouldn't use. It's a bold move. <laughs> the other word also started with a B. He walks forward and he grabs these things out of the lieutenant's hands and says, these we will take for our friends. For everything else, go back. <laughs> 
I see you again, you're a dead man. The black gate opens, all hell breaks loose, and it ends with Pippin having a troll fall on him and hearing somebody cry out, the eagles are coming, the eagles are coming, and he's thinking, wait a second, I remember that from the end of Bilbo's book, The Hobbit, where the eagles come in the Battle of Five Armies. And then we get book six, and what does Tolkien do? He takes us back to the Tower of Carathongal, which, when we left that a year ago in 1954, if you're reading the books when they first come out, what happened there? Sam left Frodo, right, thinking Frodo was dead, and then discovers Frodo isn't dead. So we'll pick up with the Tower of Carathongal, and we will finish Return of the King on Tuesday. I might start at 7.30, but you know, we'll finish it. Um, kidding. I'm not serious. And I will probably, since we will finish on Tuesday, um, I'll put up an exam. I'll probably put it up Sunday. If you want to take it early, go ahead. Uh, I'll probably put it up Sunday, and it'll be due like the following Sunday. So I'll have a whole week. Okay. Have a good weekend.